Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law. For today's case, we have a reminder that the government is required to give information to a criminal defendant that might help to show that they're not guilty of the crime. This is called Brady material. It's well established and here is a case where it made a difference. This is United States of America versus Richard Paulus, MD. In this case, Dr. Paulus was accused of of bilking the taxpayers and bilking people and creating basically insurance fraud. He was doing treatments that weren't necessary in an effort to pad the bills. And he was convicted. And then it came to light. The government didn't share certain information with him that might have shown that maybe it wasn't what it appeared to be. And so the question is, what to be done about it? Let's discuss this case. Four years, Dr. Paulus was a successful cardiologist at King's Daughters Medical Center. He performed an incredible number of enneagrams and was first in the nation for total amount billed to Medicare for these procedures. The number one doctor in the entire country for these procedures. Okay, but not all as well. Complaints emerged that Dr. Paulus was performing unnecessary procedures and several audits indicated in multiple cases Paulus had reported a higher degree of blockage in his patient's arteries than the enneagrams actually reflected, meaning that in some cases, the patient's enneagram showed a lower degree of blockage and thus a patient didn't need a stent inserted. Yet Paulus reported a much more severe blockage, inserted a stent, and then billed their patients and insurance companies for the stent procedure. So the allegation here is that he is padding his bills. He is doing work that is unnecessary that he is getting these reports and he is doing these procedures even though he doesn't need to. So it's basically insurance fraud, Medicare fraud. That is the allegation that he is that he is making these, these false reports. So what happens next? The government stated that its consultants had reviewed 495 of Dr. Paulus's procedures and concluded that 146 of them, or about 30%, were unnecessary because the patient's angiograms showed minimal arterial, arterial blockage. The government further noted that experts weren't the only one who found Dr. Paulus's procedures to be problematic. The letter explained that the consultants had also reviewed a random selection of the procedures and found 75 enneographic films with minimal blockages in the arteries that he had stented. At trial, the government called three expert witnesses. Doctors Radigast, Morrison, and Morlintero, who showed enneagrams from 72 different patients to the jury. Based on difference between what the government experts saw in the enneagrams and what Paulus reported, the experts conclude that Paulus overstated his patient's arterial blockage and inserted medically unnecessary stents. Morrison noted that over half, the, half of 11 randomly selected procedures he reviewed were unnecessary and Molterno asserted that all the stent procedures he reviewed were unnecessary. Based on this testimony, the government argued Dr. Pauls saw one thing on the enneagram and consciously wrote down another. And after 23 days of trial, four days of jury bullet deliberation, one judicial pep talk, and one Allen charge, so the jury deadlocked twice, so they gave him one initial, one initial pep talk, please try better, and then gave him one Allen charge, which is the formal version of please try better. The jury convicted Dr. Paulus of one count of healthcare fraud and 10 counts of making false statements related to healthcare. Okay, so it turns out there might have been some decent evidence here, some decent testimony, but maybe not everything is as it appears because maybe there was some other evidence that might suggest something different that the government didn't give to the doctor. So what happened? What is this evidence? Why didn't the doctor get it? Let's learn more. After remand and before sentencing, the government disclosed to Paulus the first time the so-called Shields letter. According to that letter, when the, the medical center was facing its own legal troubles, it hired a team of independent experts to review this doctor's work. The consultants reviewed 1,049 of the doctor's cases and flagged 75 of those procedures as unnecessary. In the Shields letters, the medical center's attorneys explained to the government their consultant's finding and offered to refund Medicare for payments the hospital had collected for 75 flagged procedures. So the, the medical center, when it was being um, under its own criminal liability, did a full, full review of all of his cases, and of the 1,000 plus cases it reviewed, found 75 that was unnecessary, which is a lot fewer in terms of percentage than from before. While Paulus knew the medical center had identified 75 of his procedures as problematic, 
he did not know that those consultants had reviewed 974 other procedures that they apparently found to be non-problematic. The defense viewed this evidence as exculpatory because it meant that the medical center's review found that the rate of unnecessary surgeries, 75 out of 1,049, or 7%, was far lower than what government's experts had testified at trial. Yes, yeah, 7% is quite a bit lower than the numbers we had discussed before. This lower percentage was less consistent with a systemic and purposeful fraud and more consistent with an occasional mistake or a diagnostic difference of opinion between cardiologists. Seeking more information, Paulus moved to compel the government to produce all information related to the letter. When the government later elected to charge Dr. Paulus, it planned to use the so-called shield letter in its case in chief and disclose the letter to Paulus. But the medical center objected, arguing the letter was both privileged and inadmissible. Not 100% sure why it's privileged, to be quite honest. I'd have to think about it a little bit. They hauled, they hauled in consistent, they hauled in, um, they hauled in stuff dealing with his medical records, but they're aggregates. So it doesn't really reveal patient summaries. So doctor patient doesn't seem on point and nothing else quite seems on point, but they said it's privileged. Okay. So about a month before the trial, the government brought this dispute over whether or not this letter was privileged material and the court scheduled an ex parte hearing without the defense lawyer so as to protect the medical privilege of the medical center. So the medical center says this report is privileged and so we don't want it to be used. And so the government says, okay, let's have a hearing about it. And they do it ex parte without the uh, defense lawyer there. Okay. But even though privilege was ostensibly the reason for holding the hearing ex parte, the district court made no decision regarding the privilege issue. Uh-uh. Yeah, so the, the, the operative issue at this point is whether it's privileged or not, and also whether or not that matters. So the district court maybe should have this ex parte to determine that issue, but they didn't actually determine the issue. They ruled on other grounds. They didn't actually ever say whether they thought it was privileged or not. So the district court did it bad. During the ex parte hearing, the government argued that the letter was admissible because they wanted to use it during their case in chief. They thought it also helped their case. And to its credit, the government also argued that even if the letter wasn't admissible, which, you know, maybe it's not for some reason, because it's maybe it's, it falls within hearsay. So maybe it's not admissible. The government was nevertheless obligated to disclose it to Paul's under Brady because it might be material that might suggest your innocence. So maybe it's admissible, maybe it's not, because maybe it's hearsay or whatever, but we still have to disclose it because whether it's admissible is another decision for another day. Although the government wished to introduce evidence of the medical center's review at trial for its inculpatory value, that means it inculpates you, makes you more guilty, it also recognized that the review had exculpatory value. So it also makes you look less guilty. It both makes you look more guilty and makes you look less guilty. But the district court was unconvinced, apparently. It held that the information was inadmissible, a ruling that both parties now agree was wrong, which also wasn't the issue they were trying to decide, and the government was not obligated to turn it over to Paulus. And even though it made no ruling on privilege, which is the only reason the district court was having this hearing, the district court concluded the hearing by inexplicably ordering the parties were not to disclose any more information about the review to Paulus. So, th so the district court did a bad, the district court failed to reach, failed to decide the one issue that they were there on, and then said, don't disclose anything without actually ruling on it. So the government obeyed the order because they were ordered to do so, even though it was bad. And then it came to light. And yeah, maybe that's a problem. Paulus argues the ex parte hearing in the district court violated his Sixth Amendment right. The court, the government doesn't disagree. The government argues that ex-party hearings are generally permissible to resolve privilege disputes. So the the government says, yeah, this is this is this is this is a proper procedure in some instances. However, we, the Court of Appeals, are not convinced the ex-party hearing in this case was permissible for at least several reasons. First, even if we assume that attorney-client privilege is a compelling state interest, and I'm not 100% sure how this is attorney-client either, that, that can justify ex-party communications. The district court said from the outset it would not decide the privilege issue, which is the only reason that you were there to, to be exist. It put aside the privilege issue to the side and decide issues of admissibility and discoverability instead.
And if ex parte communications are to be allowed at all, they must continue no further than the extent to which they're absolutely necessary to protect the state's compelling interest. Hmm. That's definitely true. You know, if ex parte procedures are appropriate, they're coming at the expense of the Sixth Amendment. So maybe they're appropriate in some circumstances, but they can't go any further than they need to. And you went way further than you need to. Maybe the defense lawyer might have something to say about its admissibility or its discoverability. Yeah. Second problem, the district court made no attempt to involve the defense lawyers. The court could have ordered the government to give Paulus a broad outline of the privilege and admissibility issues without disclosing the letter. So, yeah, maybe we can't disclose the letter, but we could it, we could alert the defense counsel to the issue without telling them what the letter says. So there's there's definitely ways to do that. You say, OK, we have this letter. We here's the circumstances of what it is. And we think there might be a problem. So you could have done something like that with limited information. The government defense could amount argument that the letter was both non-privileged and admissible. You could have given them something. And then by way of comparison, they point out that privilege logs, which are way more common in civil proceedings, are nevertheless not unheard of in criminal proceedings, and one could have been used here. So when something is privileged, this is how you do it. You put note in a privilege log, and then you have arguments over its privilege. So you can't just not disclose things that are privileged. You put it into a privilege log, and you disclose the privilege log, which gives them enough information to fight over the privilege without actually revealing what the privileged information is. And you can do that in a criminal case too. Third, the risk of proceeding ex parte were in fact realized in this case. Ex parte hearings are problematic because the court does not have available the fundamental instrument for judicial judgment an adversarial proceeding in which both parties participate. The district court ruled the shield letter was inadmissible. The parties agree that that's wrong. The district court determined that because it was inadmissible, that means it's not Brady material and that's just flatly wrong. Yeah, those are completely different issues. Whether it's Brady material or not has nothing to do with whether it's admissible or not and really has nothing to do with whether it's privileged or not. These are, in fact, different questions that should have been considered differently. So even if it was privileged, which no, and even if it's inadmissible, who cares? The district court ordered the government and the medical center not to disclose the shield letter to the doctor for some reason, and that was wrong too. Neither the erroneous admissibility ruling nor the erroneous discoverability ruling could justify that instruction because the only issue is privilege and you didn't even rule on that. Okay, having now learned that the district court did a bad in trying to do this ex parte when they shouldn't have and then deciding to do ex parte, didn't do it for the reason the ex parte existed and then made rulings that didn't make any sense. There is the question of does it matter? Does it matter? Was this a was this an error? that created a problem that we need to do something because, you know, not every not everything that is wrong necessarily requires reversal. If it would have come out the same either way or if it doesn't matter or if it's immaterial or, or, or if it wasn't, you know, otherwise problematic, then maybe we don't need to do anything about it. So the next question is, do we need to do something about it? Let's discuss. The Brady inquiry has three prongs. The evidence that's at issue must be favorable to the accused, either because it's exculpatory or because it would impeach another witness. The evidence must have been suppressed by the state, either willfully or inadvertently, and there must be prejudice. It must matter. But there is no Brady violation where a defendant knew or should have known of essential facts permitting him to take advantage of any exculpatory information. So if you already knew about it, even the government didn't tell you about it, if you already knew about it, it's not a Brady violation, or at least one that doesn't matter because you already knew the information, so kind of no harm, no foul on that one. The prosecution is not obligated under Brady to disclose information to the defense the defense already knew or should have known. The government argues that Paulus knew the essential facts described in the shield letter and could have gathered the missing detail, such as the sample size, with minimal investigation. The prosecution has informed Paulus in a letter that the medical consultants reviewed a random sample of the procedures and flagged 75 of them as unnecessary. Then, according to the government, based on this information, Paulus could and should have gathered the detail, the sample size, simply by asking. So the government argues, because they already have the conviction in place and they don't want to reverse that, obviously. So the government argues that, okay, what you knew is that they reviewed 75 of your procedures as unnecessary. So all you needed to determine was how many total, how many total, and you could have simply asked for it. So that was no big, no, no big deal. But then the court says it kind of is a big deal. The court says, we'd have to completely ignore the record to accept the government's argument 
After all, it was the medical center that opposed the government's disclosing of the shield letter to the doctor in the first place. And it was the medical center that argued the letter was privileged and inadmissible. Thus, it is not reasonable to assume that if the doctor had only asked, the medical center would be giving the details. Yeah, that doesn't seem likely since they're the ones that didn't want to disclose anything about this anyway. Further, even if the government is right about whether he could reconstruct it, the question is not whether or not he could have eventually have obtained the information. The Brady standard does not allow the state to simply turn over some evidence on the assumption the defense counsel will find a cookie from the trail of crumbs. So if you already knew about it, then great, but it doesn't require you to reconstruct anything. And so like maybe you could have done this, but you don't have to. The, the, you only are required to know what you know. And what you knew was that it was 75. You didn't know the total number. So maybe you could have asked, but that's not the standard. The government has to tell you. The other issue is prejudice. In order to prove that prejudice ensued from the government's withholding of the letter, Pauls must prove the evidence was material, meaning the doctor must prove that there's some reasonable probability that had the evidence been disclosed, the result of the proceeding would have been different. The question is not whether the defendant would have been more likely than not to have received a different verdict, that's not the question, but whether in the absence he received a fair trial, understood as a trial that is worthy of confidence in the verdict. The revelation of the letter and the missing details from the medical center review undermines our confidence in the verdict, and thus we find that withholding them prejudiced the doctor. So we're not sure whether or not he would have won or not, but it does go to the idea that, you know, this would have been information that might have been really helpful. The argument that the omitted details from the letter are material is fairly simple. Because the medical center review found misdiagnosis in a much smaller percentage of cases than the government found, so 7% as opposed to 50%, those numbers are kind of different, the study tends to refute the government's evidence that the doctor systematically misdiagnosed the amount of blockage in the patient's arteries. Instead, he may have made an occasional mistake, or maybe that there's differences of opinion, as would happen. And if Pauls didn't systematically overstate his patient's blockages, that weakens the government's evidence that he intentionally defrauded his patients, the health insurance companies, or the government. Yeah, so if he's only if he's only wrong 7% of the time, and I have to wonder how, how that compares to other doctors, whether or not 7% is a lot or not. So it, maybe he's a little bit more conservative than your average doctor. So he applies them a little bit more conservatively than some doctors would. Is he within the bounds of what's medically proper? 7% doesn't strike me as immediately obvious. The answer is no. While Ragosta reviewed 250 to 300 of the procedures, that's still far fewer than the 1,049 reviewed by the medical center. Further, Ragosta's sample was not random. 75 of the 250 to 300 files reviewed by him were selected for review because they flagged them as problematic. So he didn't get a random sample. So he thought, oh, it's 75 of 300, which sounds like a quarter. That sounds like a lot. Maybe it's more than 7% though. Armed with the fact that the medical center pulled 75 from the sample of 1,049, the doctor may have argued that the sample the other doctor got was a little cherry picking. Yeah, so maybe this other doctor that testified from the stand, this doctor is completely incompetent, came to that conclusion because of bad information. And maybe it's because he, he reviewed 300 files, but in those 300 were the 75 bad ones. And 75 is a quarter. And he thought, hmm, quarter is pretty high. You know, he's wrong 25% of the time. That doesn't sound good. Maybe if this doctor knew he was only wrong 7% of the time, he'd come to different conclusions because that seems maybe within the bounds of what's medically acceptable. The government also attempts to argue that the Shields letter would have shattered Paulus's key storyline, that he was a brilliant doctor being treated unfairly by the government. So the government says this would have shattered your defense because you're so brilliant. And then the court says that's not how this works. Paulus could have changed his defense strategy if given the evidence at trial, which is his right to do. He could have changed his strategy. In fact, the government recognized as much at the ex-party hearing, as part of the argument was that he, they were obliged to disclose it. And furthermore, it doesn't seem like the letter is really incompatible with the defense he offered. So first of all, he could have changed his defense. And second of all, it's not clear he would have to. Paulus could have plausibly argued both that he was an excellent doctor and that excellent doctors still make mistakes or sometimes disagree with other excellent doctors, which seems like a very plausible conclusion. It's hard to see why Paulus couldn't have successfully incorporated the letter into his defense at trial. And so the governments argue that the letter would shatter his defense fails. 
yeah, no, you know, he he can he can actually maintain both these positions at the same time, or he could take a different position. One of these would be fine, but it's well within the bounds of reasonable. Yes. We do sympathize with the prosecution because we recognize the government believed it had an obligation to disclose the letter to the doctor, and it did not do so solely because of the district court's order. Bad district court. But irrespective of good faith or bad faith of the prosecution, the failure to disclose favorable material evidence to the defense violates due process. The government tried, man. The government tried. Now they're getting burned. Because Brady is about the fairness of trial and not about ferreting out the misdeeds of a prosecutor, it doesn't matter how blameless or blameworthy the prosecution might have been. And therefore, we vacate and remand for a new trial, assuming the government is still interested in trying. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case of United States of America versus Dr. Richard Paulus. In this case, Dr. Paulus was convicted of Medicare and insurance fraud because the government had evidence that he was giving stints to way more people than needed it. And then it turned out that a full review of his cases, not so much. It Maybe he was wrong 7% of the time. And even then, it's a little bit debatable if he was wrong. So maybe that would have materially impacted his defense. So he gets to go back to trial if the government's still interested and try again, and maybe it will be different this time. I mean, the jury did de deadlock twice the last time. So maybe with this new evidence, they won't deadlock. Maybe they'll just say not guilty. So we'll have to find out what happens next, but at least for the moment, that's the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.